Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. I have an excellent story for you. Those of you who follow me on Instagram and Twitter probably know that I went to Chicago back at the end of July, and I went to see today's guest, Brita Miller. She is an author and a playwright and a former caregiver for her mom. So thanks for joining me, Brita. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. I am delighted. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I thoroughly enjoyed the play, but before we get into that, for those who are unfamiliar with you, Tell us about yourself and your mom and a little bit about your caregiving journey, because that will lead where we go to next. Sure. Well, I um, live in a rural in a small town in southeastern Michigan, and um, I've always had I'm the only daughter with four brothers, therefore the default caregiver. Right. Yep. And my mom and I had always had a good relationship as uh, and I was very grateful for that had a young family, three young teenagers, and my mom was an extremely independent, feisty, charming little Irish lady who loved life. She would walk the mile to my house regularly, did yoga, and loved it. And then one day, she had a violent coughing fit and developed a, an, uh, an, an AVM of a blood vessel burst in her brain. And uh, we rushed her to the hospital. She didn't have a stroke. Um, but she was very weak and she would need brain surgery. We ended up uh, taking care of her, a lot more details there, but she ended up moving in with us. And I was, um, at first it was, you know, really good. She really enjoyed being around all the kids. And then she really started to decline. She developed uh, congestive heart failure, which led to vascular dementia. And I was her primary caregiver for nearly six years. And three young teenagers, uh, two with special needs, what could go wrong? (laughs) And honestly, I didn't know what I didn't know. All I knew is that I love my mom. And I've done a lot of different things in my life, but being my mom's caregiver as she experienced vascular dementia was one of the most challenging and difficult things I've ever done. In hindsight, it was also one of the best things I've ever done. And I learned a lot. And along the way, people would ask me for advice. and, And I just realized how isolated so many i have never felt so isolated in my entire life is when i was stuck at home caring for my mom she couldn't be left alone there were no play groups you know like mommy and daughter play groups like there was when my kids were little and when my mom developed incontinence um I didn't even know. Oh, I was really just worried about my furniture, <laughs> but I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know if it was normal. And I realized when I was potty training my kids, other moms would discuss these things and we would talk about, so are you using pull-ups or do you like the little panties? <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody, nobody said to me, so how's your mom doing? Are you using Depends yet? What brand do you like? No, nobody ever brought it up. Nobody talked about it. And so I thought, I'm the worst. I I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who to ask. I don't know what's, I had no frame of reference and I struggled for a long, long time. So I ended up writing the book that I wished I had because I had lots of books, but I was so burned out and exhausted. I would sit down to read and I'd get in two, three pages and I'd be out like a light. So I needed something accessible and quick and funny and engaging. And I That's why I wrote my first book. And uh, anyway, then went on to write other things. I speak to groups, to healthcare organizations, because the thing is about caregivers, we're the worst at taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We know what we're supposed to do, but we're just too burned out, exhausted and tired to actually do it. And then when we do do it, we feel guilty about it or we feel we're being selfish. And my goal and my mission in life is to help people get over that. Because if you're a wreck, you're not going to be able to take care of anybody else until you take care of yourself. Right. And they feel it. Oh, definitely. Oh, you know what? I mean, think about it. You know, I mean, if, if, if I didn't want my mom to make, to feel like a burden, all I had to do was be snappy, short tempered and cranky. And how's she going to feel right? It's it's not good for anybody. So 
So that's where it all went. And then during COVID, I asked myself, the, my mom has been gone now for 10 years. So I've, I've healed and I've learned a lot and I help a lot of other people. But I, I found humor was um, was my saving grace because, you know, there's a lot of stuff to deal with. And by stuff, I don't mean stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yep. um, you need to keep your sense of humor. <laughs> and if you're overtired and cranky and exhausted, it's hard to have a sense of humor. So I won't say I always had it in the moment, but in hindsight and looking back, I, you know, I've been able to find the joy and the humor. And I asked myself this big Oof. question, which was, <laughs> what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? And I, in my head, and as a speaker and a storyteller, someone had mentioned to me, they said, Brita, as is that you should do a one woman show. And at the time I said, no, come on. And then I started thinking about it and I said, wouldn't that be amazing? And I found a director and a collaborator who would help me write it and shape it. And um, it 11 revisions. <laughs> and it is now something that I, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. It's called Mrs. Kelly's Journey Home. And the important thing is, is that it's it's not a play about dementia. It's, no, it's it is not. about no. my mother's life. Dementia is a part of the play, is a part of the story and my being a caregiver, but it does not define the play. Just as it's important to remember, dementia did not define my mother. And that's not what I remember about her and what I focus on in her life. And I, I, I hope it is inspiring and uplifting and um, that, that not just caregivers, but that everybody can find something to relate to. Well, I saw it with a neuropsychologist friend of mine. Um, he is not a caregiver. He does deal with his mom, but she doesn't need care. She's just aging like the rest of us. And then um, the gal that's one of the team for the Circle It app. She is caregiving for her mom. So we all, we were all there. So we all had slightly different perspectives and all three of us just thoroughly, thoroughly loved it. And, you know, when my friend Christopher was taking me back to my hotel, you know, we were talking about it and I said, you know, this is the kind of stories that, you know, more of us need to tell and it's happening, you know, being a Gen X generation person I get, I've, I, it's kind of, I always feel like I'm standing between two, two major groups. You know, so you've got the baby boomers who are older and don't understand why these millennials are putting all of the details about their loved one out there on the internet. And I was very cautious what I shared with my mom because I knew like, there are some stuff that I share that if she knew she would kill me, but yes. I tried, <laughs> I tried to keep the dignity and, but still showcase what advanced Alzheimer's looked like because, you know, so many people feel like, you know, Alzheimer's or cognitive impairments, just, it's just forgetting. It's just not remembering what you had for breakfast, or maybe you can't remember somebody's name and hell, I can't remember people's names after you introduce me and I don't have a cognitive impairment. So it's just some brain glitch that's been this way all my life. And people need to understand what what the whole journey is like. And that's what I loved about the second half of the play talked about it and it was still funny. And you know, you, there was a lot of people nodding their heads. Uh huh. Yep. Been there, done that and totally get it. And even like for my friend, Christopher, now he does deal with patients that have Alzheimer's. So he's, you know, he's not unconnected to our world, to the caregiving world, but he's not a caregiver he could relate as well. And I think it helps people to understand, you know, what's going on so that, you know, if you're better, you know, if you're blessed not to have to, I don't want to say not to have to, but if you're blessed that you don't end up with someone in your family or your immediate circle, that's got a cognitive impairment, some form of dementia, because your mom didn't have Alzheimer's like mine, you might, you know, maybe your neighbor has is taking care of their mom. Maybe you're their neighbor. And now they can be like, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about this, this cognitive impairment stuff. And I know Breed is taking care of her mom. I'm going to go see if she, you know, needs me to bring a casserole or, you know, I'm also, I'm mostly Scottish, but a lot of Irish too. So it's like, maybe I'll just bring her over a cup of tea and some scones and we can just shoot the breeze or the, uh, 
the other word that you yeah, that never that. happened. That would have been great. I would have loved that. I got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, there was a gal in my support group. So I facilitated a support group. The one that I attended as a caregiver who, let's see, her husband had Alzheimer's or I forget. He, I forget exactly which disease he had, but she also had super highly special needs adult children. Um, one was blind and deaf who unfortunately died from, uh, he got sick, like pneumonia or something, but I know pneumonia is fixable. I don't remember exactly what happened. And she just, she had way more on her plate than she could handle. And she kept saying, you know, I would just love it if somebody could come over, ignore the mess and just have tea with me. And I'm like, I can't do the first half because I'm a neat freak, but I could do the second half. <laughs> And so I don't know if anybody ever did that for her. Um, I was in the thick of it with my mom, so I didn't feel like I was the kind of person that could do that. I'm like, you know, I'm doing the podcast and I'm doing only with my mother and my other rest of my life. Like, I can't take on everybody else's stuff, too. So but that's the kind of stuff we need. You know, people need to understand we've got TV shows. We've got more books, you know, and I'm assuming in the last 10 years since your mom has passed that you've seen that the conversations have increased and the stigma has decreased? Absolutely. Um, although I will say this, is that when I see um, plays or television shows or movies about dementia, they're so sad. And I mean, it is sad. It is hard. Um, but I think when you're in the midst of it, you don't need to be reminded of that. You know, you know how hard it is. And so I think one of the things I wanted to do with Mrs. Kelly's journey home was not to diminish that and not to ignore it, but to look at it through a different lens and to look at it um, and to share some creative ideas. And the biggest message that I want to get through, apart from taking care of yourself, because most of the stories I tell are cautionary tales, like, don't be me. <laughs> don't, <true. laughs> don't, you know, go get yourself this so burned out that you can't even deal with a pie, for God's sakes, you know. <laughs> but more so that it's, you know, you said it yourself, it's about dignity and care. And to me, the two words that I think are important to remember are no regrets. And to forgive yourself, you know, that on any given day, you do the best you can. And some days are going to be better than others. And other days are harder than others. But you move forward and you just say, you know what? I didn't get enough sleep. I'm not eating well. I, I need to, I just need to go for a walk. Or I need to go find a place to take a nap by myself that no one's going to knock on the door and ask me if I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, but you know, to do that. And so now I'm able to look back and, and I've forgiven myself for things that I didn't do as well as I wished I had. And, um, also to know that, you know, I'm not a super woman. I'm not a superhuman. I'm certainly not perfect, but I did my best and everything I did, I did out of love and it didn't sometimes went sideways. But, you know, that's what happens. And the standard that we set for ourselves is so unrealistic. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, Jennifer, about why caregivers feel so bad and why they feel guilty and why it's so hard. And I think back to the contrast when you're raising and caring for young children, that they grow up, they become more independent, the trajectory of their needs, you know, lessens, right? If you're caring for someone who is sick and has a curable illness, you can see in, you know improvement and they're going to get better and they get better and you do all the things you're supposed to do. The wounds heal, the, the bones heal, all of these things happen and it's satisfying. When you're caring for a person with Alzheimer's and dementia, they're not getting better. No matter what you do, no matter how perfect you think you are in terms of managing medicine and doctor's appointments and therapies and um, making accommodations, it's, it's still going downhill. And that is so hard for all of us to accept, maybe particularly Americans, maybe particularly women who are used to being fixers, you know, that yeah. we find out what needs to be done. We make a list, we get all the stuff and then we do it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm a total list maker. My to-do list is right next to me. <laughs> yes. I have electronic to-do lists. I have my paper to-do list. And I get really a big thrill of checking the box off. Well, yep. when you're caring off. for <laughs> Yeah, when you're caring for someone who has multiple health issues, because typically you don't have just Alzheimer's, you got all kinds of other stuff going on too. And then that's just like the frosting on the cake of despair (laughs) of like, oh, how am I going to explain this? You know, my mom used to get really upset with me that I was trying to make her take more pills. They were mind altering drugs like Advil. (laughs) Oh dear. (laughs) And, and she had arthritis and I called, I had a great relationship with her doctor and I called her and I said, She's refusing to take Advil because she thinks I'm trying to push pills on her. And she's complaining about her arthritis and I'm really frustrated. And her doctor was wonderful. She was also a gerontologist. And she said, okay, Brita, if you can tell her, and I'm going to tell her if you don't tell her that if she refuses to take the Advil, she's not allowed to talk about the arthritis at all. And my mom was in one of those days where she was all there and she could get that. And, um, she softened up a little bit. She's like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, I big been win. Sne- big yeah. win. Mom's yeah. taking two Advil. Woohoo. Oh, <laughs> see, I would have just crushed them up and put them in her food because, one, I'm ornery as heck. Um, that is the fighting Scottish clan that is most of my DNA. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, uh. but my mom did not have other health issues. My mom was totally healthy except for her brain. Mm. which was better and worse because she for a long time presented as quote normal, whatever normal means, you know, she did not look like she had any kind of problem other than again, Henri. That's like my whole family's DNA is just (laughs) Henri and we all have skills. Come on. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and Alzheimer's didn't diminish the Henri either. Hoof Lord almighty. But my goal with my mom was to give her as much joy and pleasure and quality of life as possible without dragging out dying from Alzheimer's. So quality over quantity, which was easier, I think, for me because she didn't have other health issues. I mean, she wasn't in she was on just a couple of medications, mostly for the Alzheimer's. You know, she didn't have any heart disease or diabetes or any of those other things that require medications. So. You know, like I said, it was easier. And I think tying back to what you said about, you know, being fixers and there, there is no reward when you are taking care of somebody who is going to die, no matter how good a job you do. I mean, it's like, you could be the perfect caregiver, whatever that means. And they're still going to decline. They're still going to, you know, end up forgetting how to feed themselves and all the things that happen. And then just like all of us, they're going to die. And so there is no reward of, you know, graduating preschool, graduating from kindergarten, graduating from high school, college, whatever, you know, getting the big job, whatever life. Joy. The next big step that you yeah. like. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's I'll, where I think the only thing to look for is to have no regrets and to say, did I, did I treat mom with dignity? Did I, you know, find ways to, have more patience or to be more tolerant or, you know, in the olden days, I remember when people used to spend a lot of time trying to reorient people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, what day is today? It's Tuesday, you know, and make now what day is today? And and they would spend a lot of time bringing them into reality. Right. And I think fortunately now we've learned what's the point in that? It just frustrates them. It annoys you. What difference does it make if they think that it's Sunday morning in 1963 and they're remembering, you know, going to church or something like that? And to me, as long as it doesn't involve like them driving a car <laughs> or doing something dangerous, talk about it. And, and when my mother-in-law, who did have Alzheimer's for 12 years, her husband of 64 years passed away before she did, and he was her primary caregiver. And she would, she was there in the house when he passed away. She went to the funeral. This was not withheld from her, but she didn't remember it. She would often ask, where is Chuck? Where is Chuck? Her daughters, oops, her daughters have um, 
you know, they were of the mindset of, well, mom, you remember dad died. And then it would be like knife in the heart, fresh grief all over again. And then 15 minutes later, she'd ask again. And they would constantly, they said, well, we can't lie to mom. And I said, yes, you can. It's called therapeutic fibbing. <laughs> and what you do is whenever she would ask me about Chuck and where he was, I'll say, such a handsome man. Now tell me again, where did you guys meet? Because they met in high school. And then she would go right back to that memory of in 19. 19- 48 or 44, whatever it was. And she could tell you about that and she'd be all happy. And she wouldn't think about asking about him for a little while. And so I think those are things we can learn to not frustrate the people in our lives that we're caring for, to bring them to our reality. As long as they're safe, I don't care. You know, want to talk about pretend we're going fishing? Let's put stuff in the bathtub and, you know... (laughs) Put a string in there with a rubber ducky. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know. That would work. That that's I don't like fish, so that'd be okay with that version. I don't I laugh, know. I've... My my dad's name was Chuck, and same scenario. He was on hospice, died about ten ish, somewhere close to ten o'clock at night on March second, twenty seventeen. My mom seemed to know the next morning, probably because the caregiver said something. Um, I know they came and took my dad's body away in the middle of the night. Um, We all showed up, my sister and I. Lord, it's been so long now. I guess it was just my sister and I. I can't remember if my daughter was there. Um, And we took mom out. Well, my mom had a hair, like a scheduled hair appointment. Lord Almighty. It was always the cut and color every four weeks. It was like, ugh. (laughs) It's like. I was so glad when we finally got rid of it. Well, I gave up on the coloring, but she didn't remember. She went to the funeral, the whole same deal. <laughs> and I would go visit her and she, yeah. she thought I was her best friend, which most of my listeners know. And there was one day her room was on the opposite side of the building from the exit. And so I'm like, Oh, Hey, I'm here to take you to whatever we were doing. I, I took her out frequently as she progressed. We ended up just going to the park to watch children I always like to tell people we were the creeper old ladies. My husband even actually made that comment the other day in regards to something. He's like, maybe your mom was a creeper in another life. And I'm like, that's <laughs> kind of weird, but kind of funny to think about. I yeah. think she just enjoyed watching kids because she was a mom and a grandma. But, you yeah. know, there was there was times when I would say people would say, what do you do with your mom? I'm like, oh, we're going to go watch children, which sounded so terrible. That's where all that joke came. But we're, <laughs> you know, as we exit her doorway, She's like, does my husband know where I'm going? And it was always that snotty tone of voice because he was he was kind of a grumpy old guy. Yeah. And I said, yes, mom, dad knows where we're going. You know, we get like a third of the way to the door. Does my husband know where I'm going? I am not kidding. She asked me this six times between her her door and the car, which couldn't have been more than maybe 300 feet. If oh. that. I think it was probably less. It felt like five miles. By the time we got to the car, I was like, I am so irritated at this point. I'm like, do I just stuff her in the trunk? (laughs) Do I put her back in the building and just call it a day? And then I swear it was like somebody slapped me upside the head. She asked me again and I'm like, oh, yeah, I saw Chuck at the Rotary this afternoon. I told him we were going to go get your nails done, whatever. It was just like, as soon as I told her what she wanted to hear, which was not yes, dad knows where we're going because that didn't answer her question. She wanted to know if her husband knew where we were going. Right. And her best friend's dad was not her husband. (laughs) It was so confusing. And she stopped asking. And there was, that's, I had to deal with the whole, is my husband, and always that, that tone of voice, which just, it was like, could we just please remember the nice times? Do we have to remember that he was just like, right. And then one day, and I swear this is, I think this is most families, you end up having those really important conversations in the car. (laughs) We're driving along and she's talking about how pretty the sky is with the blue sky and the puffy clouds and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thankfully able to focus on driving. And the next thing I know, I hear, you know, it was really sad when your dad died. Thank God we were at a red light. Because that came so far out of the blue, I might as well have been hit by a semi-truck. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, and I was shocked. And I said, um, yeah. 
but he wasn't well and i think it's better that you know he's not having to deal with all the diabetes and all that she goes yeah that's true isn't that really a pretty tree that was the end of that yep it yep. was crazy it was like woo. yeah I, I mean you could get whiplash from whoop 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 and and you know i think when you're kid another thing that i thought of and tell me if you agree that when you care for someone with dementia every day is like a day at the improv without the applause you know because you don't know what year what day what the mindset is when they get, come out of that bedroom like okay where are we going today what are you going talk about what's your mindset where are you in your head and how can i find a way to you know if if you if you're upset i just need to change the subject or divert you and music was always a good go to you know just put on some music and um it's a, an amazing distraction that can get them out of you know some real agitation but um yeah it's it's you have to be nimble and you know on your toes to be flexible and not everybody is. And and if you're not, then you have to forgive yourself and, and find a way to, to just, you know, in fact, um, I have a Gumby in here and Gumby is my motto because blessed are the flexible for they shall not get bent out of shape. I love that phrase. I yes. love that. I think people, not everybody like us are creative and it's hard to do improv, which you reminded me, I really got to find somebody that teaches improv to talk on the podcast. Cause I think that would be cool. Yeah. Especially for those who people who aren't creative. Like I think I, well, I probably could, I think maybe my, my one liners have gotten better because I had to deal with my mother. I don't know. I'll have to think on that one, but it's, it's hard because, you know, we're supposed to have respect for our parents and we're supposed to, you know, we're not supposed to lie to mom, God forbid, but you know, we got to lie and pretend we're your best friend that your husband's well, still it's alive. It's whatever you're, you know, you think about what is your intention. If your intention is to deceive or manipulate or something negative, then no, of course not. But if your intention is to be kind and to prevent further pain, then maybe it's not an out and out lie. It's just changing the subject or not answering the question directly. But to, to speak about improv, I can give you a couple of pointers if you like um, to get there. So the first rule of improv improv improvisational theater is um, when your partner, who is the other actor on stage, you're in a scenario, there's no script, you don't know where it's going, and they might give you a topic like, um, okay, you're at a diner, you're having lunch, and you have a crabby waitress. So that's the setting, and you two are seated at the table. Whenever your, your partner is going to say something, and your job is to respond back, but you never say, no, I don't like that idea. That's not a good idea. We're not going to go that way. Whatever the partner says, like if they say, you know, the hamburgers here, I hear they're not made of real meat or something. Right, that you're going to go off on a tangent. You don't argue with them. You say yes, and I hear the chicken is suspect too, <laughs> or something. You know, so it's yes and. So you you're building a story. So they say something. You you agree with them. You say yes, and did you know? Or and I think we should do this. Yes, and here's more information. But your partner has dementia. So who knows where this story is going to go, right? But it's you don't have to worry about trying to be funny because uh, nobody cares and no one is there to listen. You are you are your only audience because if you make a joke, your person's probably not going to get it. So that's fine. <laughs> so there's no pressure. Um, but it allows you that for your brain, instead of getting annoyed and frustrated about the repetitive questioning or the situation, you're taking them down a different road that is respectful, that maintains their dignity because you're acknowledging what they're talking about and you're participating with them. But you don't have an agenda. You don't say the story's got to end here because that's what I thought. Improv is not like that. You don't know where improv is going to go. But the, the key is two people in exchange, one says something, the other person must agree and then add to the story and then see what their response is. And their response may be off the wall, something different. Then you go that way. That's okay. 
You don't say, no, 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 we're in the diner. Remember, we're talking about the food and say, yeah, I love that dance class. <laughs> Who cares? Just go with the flow. And and then if you get really fed up, snacks and food are always good and music is a good diversion. But for a few minutes, it, it might be a lot of fun. I got ex- got to experience that a little bit with my mom when this was actually close to her passing. She was sitting outside. They had a beautiful courtyard with, you know, where the roof came out over the walkway. So it was shaded, but it was open pretty much on three sides, but technically one side because it was like a big O and it was open in the middle. And she's sitting there and she was talking to this gentleman, which was interesting because it was like her wedding anniversary had my dad still been around. And she she did not engage with the other male residents much. There was one guy that she did because he had other dogs, but occasionally she thought he had like, I don't want to say nefarious thoughts, but you know, she wasn't interested in a romance. And sometimes she, that's, she attributed that to the other men, even though I'm not sure they thought that either, but she was talking, he left and, and we were, I think I asked her a question and she said, well, my brothers are normal people now. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm really glad to hear they're normal. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, well, I think one of them might be, but the other one, no, nah, I don't think he's ever been normal. Yeah. <laughs> and and you was, know, and that's a great line. You remembered it. Thank God. But that's a yeah. great line to write down. Like what? What do you mean by that? You can't ask her that, but it, it, it would, it's, it's a great memory to have. Yeah. And it would have been easy to, um, because I, I knew it was interesting. My mom is the oldest of four. Her sister is 11 years younger than her was. And I mean, my aunt's still around. Mom's not. And she forgot her sister. So she would remember. And one brother would bring the sister. So the younger brother would bring the sister fairly regularly to visit. So it was kind of annoying to me that she remembered the brother who pretty much I haven't heard from in years and years and years. And, you know, the other brother, the one that I think is probably is okay, probably still normal. (laughs) And her sister, you know, it's like, so when she said, oh, my brothers are normal people, it would have been really easy to like go right to the negative. Well, like, well, what about your sister? Even though I kind of knew she probably forgot her sister, which made me sad. Or, you know, well, I don't think such and such brother is normal because, you know, I could have just gone right down negative alley and I didn't. I just... It just, I guess it just struck the funny bone that day and I wasn't tired or stressed. So, you know, and I asked her, so I said something about, oh, they're, oh, they are. That's really good to hear. I asked her another question and then she started talking about something else. I'm like, okay, I guess that's over. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. You know, it's just like a little fleeting moment and you make an appropriate response to be as pleasant as you can. There's This is not the time for an argument or a, a disagreement or anything because it's not going to end well. We just know that it will not end well. And then you'll feel bad and you'll feel guilty and you'll think, oh, yeah, you know, because it's not about winning the argument or about making a point ever. 
ever with a person with dementia, right? It's about surviving the day yeah. and just trying to find, like, maybe at the end of the day, you put your head down and you think, okay, what? Uh, this, here's two good questions to ask yourself. What went way better than I thought it would? <laughs> That's one. And the other is, what wasn't as bad as I was afraid it was going to be? Right. And maybe that's, you know, uh, you know, like the dreaded shower day or whatever it might be, um, you know, and that's that's the way we get through it all. And we we keep our heart and our mind intact. We maintain their dignity and we find ways um, to to just look for the goodness. And that's really what I think Mrs. Kelly's journey home is about. It's about looking for the goodness, remembering it. You know, when my when my mom was in hospice care in my home and she was really, really on the downside here and, and I'm watching her decline every day. And I I decided I'm sitting in a room with her and I had my laptop and I made this digital family photo album that wasn't just photos, but it was a narrative. It was the stories that she had shared with me because I felt as the only daughter, I was the keeper of these stories. You know, I knew them better than anyone and I didn't want to lose them. So I wrote them down. And what was, I didn't realize how smart this was, but it was so therapeutic because instead of focusing on my 85 year old mom who was getting smaller and smaller in her bed and was, you know, laying in a fetal position, instead of thinking about and looking at her like that, I was spending time next to her, you know, next to her bed with my laptop, looking at all these pictures of her as this vibrant young woman emigrating from Ireland, building a life in America, getting into trouble with Mrs. Wilson, all kinds of stuff <laughs> that she did. And um, it was it was the, the smartest thing that I unintentionally did. And then at the end, I have this wonderful book, which ended up being, and now actually what's great about having this family album and it's digital, I had all these documents, birth certificates and, you know, marriage licenses and stuff like that. And I was the only one and I'm not a scrapbook girl. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what's going to happen to all this stuff? You know, do I divvy, divvy it up amongst my brothers? I don't think they really want it. So they were all scanned and then put into this book and it lives at blurb.com and I'm not affiliated with them and it's free. You can do, you can design your own book. But then when my nieces and nephews get married, I order a book for them. And now they have the family history in a book with all the names and dates of the cousins and, you know, wh who married who and how many kids they had and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it, it's wonderful. I can agree with that because I'm not sure I told you this, but my mom was the third woman on. Um, so my mom, my maternal great grandmother had dementia. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, probably mixed dementias, but nobody ever bothered to diagnose it, which, you know, I don't blame them. And then my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So do you know how much family history is lost? And then we've had the inevitable family rifts. Some of it my dad kind of oh. caused. A lot of it was just caring for grandma, then caring for, my, you know, my dad. They There's asked, a lot of bad behavior going around in every family. I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's like, like I said, my mom, my mom was the oldest of four. So the next, her oldest brother, I didn't even hear from him when she died. It's like, well, okay, whatever. You know, yeah. so when I say that kind of family rifts, apparently, I don't know, I don't understand what's going on. Why he wouldn't at least send me a card, send me a text message, something. I don't know. But that, so I, I, when we moved, we scanned all the family photos and holy crap, it was like $700 worth of scanning of slides and movies and photos and yada, yada. And now I've noticed as, you know, like my husband got back into ancestry.com and he's traced, you know, got a kind of a family tree going on pretty far back. And I've gotten a little bit more into it. I know my mom and my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, they started, um, doing the family tree in the late nineties, but they kind of hit a road bump when allegedly I have a three times great grandmother who is native American, but she didn't show up in my DNA. So I don't know if I'm not sure how they ended up with a roadblock 
with this person that's supposedly in my family that doesn't have government papers because obviously they weren't part of the American government, but she didn't show up in my DNA. So I don't know what that means. And I can't ask my mom or my grandfather because they're gone. Yeah. And the, I yeah. only have one brother that, or one uncle, one of my mom's brothers that I could ask. And maybe one of these days well, I should do that. And you bring up a really good point that, you know, for those family members who do not have dementia, um, to, to ask them, you know, to share stories. Uh, one of the best moments of the play was before I did the premiere last year, my mom's sister, my Auntie Betty, is 93. She's sharp as a tack, lives alone, and she lives about three hours from me. So I drove out to her house and I said, Auntie Betty, I have uh, written a play and I want to perform it for you because you know this story better than anyone. You lived it and you know, and I, I need to know, if, you know, are there mistakes or did, you know, I don't want to embarrass myself. So I, I performed the whole show just for her. And, you know, she gets teary eyed and she laughs. And at the end, she's so sweet. And she looks at me and she says, Brida, I don't know how you did it, but you got it just right. And so I have the Auntie Betty seal of approval. Okay. And that's all that matters. So that's whatever it. critics say or whatever, but uh, you know, it is the truth. It is authentic warts and all. And, um, you know, I liked like when I portray my dad, I play four characters in the play. Um, I am as unfiltered as my father's Paul Mall cigarettes <laughs> because I'm not trying to um, paint them as saints, but they're also not devils and they're they're imperfect people as I am. But I hope by sharing this authentic portrait of a family that people will come away inspired to think of their own stories that everyone you know, if you think about who's your Mrs. Kelly in your life that wasn't a famous person, but maybe maybe she's, you know, a mom that you knew of or a mom figure that you knew of or somebody that, um, you know, is special. But but the other point, too, is for those who um, perhaps didn't have a mom like Mrs. Kelly, that when they see an elderly person with dementia, that they think of the whole person that they don't think of them just as an older person with dementia and that's all they're about. But maybe they might stop and think about, I wonder what kind of a spitfire she was when she was 30 or what adventure she went on or what did she do? And the, the opportunity for respect and the opportunity for compassion is an important thing. And, and I'm hopeful that that might be one of the outcomes uh, as more people see the show. Agreed. I think the more we understand other people's lived experiences, the better we are at compassion and understanding and under, being able to deal with people who are not like us. Yes. You know, we have a very diverse population in this country, yeah. in the United States, for those people who aren't in, I have listeners that aren't in the United States, and yeah. I'm sure other countries are the same. I can't speak to that as well because I... My travel uh, itinerary got uh, seriously cramped with COVID, but I made it to Chicago to see you. So that was fun. You did. And you know, it's another good one as, as you're talking about how this that I saw and I, I didn't make this up, of course, but it's that, you know, we're not all in the same boat. Some people have yachts. Some people have speed boats. Some people have pontoons. Some people have a raft that they are clinging to, but we are all in the same storm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important to remember that, you know, some people have great resources. They have money. They have supportive family. They have, um, you know, a, a, they live in an area mm -hmm. with great medical care or whatever. And, and they have the ability financially and otherwise to make use of that. And others do not. Other people are all by themselves trying to figure this out. Um, they're the only person caring for one or two parents and they have very limited resources, very limited income, um, not good medical care where they live. And it's so important to to be mindful of that. And it, it can make you appreciate what you do have. Or, you know, when I look at people with uh, with Lewy body dementia or, um, you know, Alzheimer's, uh, there are so many situations that are so much worse, you know, than the situation I dealt with. And um, I just have, I, I have a great appreciation for, 
for that and acknowledgement, you know, it could have been worse. So That's one, of the, <clears throat> one of the things I learned, ooh, probably two decades ago, dear Lord, it's making me feel old, <laughs> is um, I, I have a, I, I'm going to, I'm going to use this in the past tense. I used to easily go to the negative and people still hear like, I'll make a statement like, man, it's hot today. It's supposed to be 103 here today. That's hot. I like it warm. That is hot. Period. It's going to be hot today. That is not a complaint. It's just a statement, but a lot of people hear it as a complaint. So I've had to deal with a lot of that in my life. And one mm -hmm. of the ways to get out of that negative thought process, the focusing on the bad and not the good, is to to just, and I don't even keep a gratitude journal, but every day I take a few minutes and go, what do I have to be grateful for? And one of my new things is I took up paddleboarding because we live not on, on a lake, the lake's across the street. But now I've taken my oldest golden retriever, Luna. She goes with me and we oh. have the best time. That's so cool. <laughs> and she just, she just lays there and it's like, okay, human, please paddle me about the lake. Paddle I me over to there. Go this way, please. <laughs> yes, there, there are other humans over there, please. Yes. Let's go see. And, and she's just really calm. And I do not stand up while paddleboarding with her because occasionally she wants to stand up and shift and look at something else. And I know what I know we'd end up in the drink. Yeah. But, um, you know, we have a, so cool. coming up in October, we have a witches on the water, which is basically people dressing up in witch costumes and paddleboarding across the lake. I do not wear black because it doesn't look good on me. So I am creating a Glenda the Good Witch costume that is not going to drown me if I fall in. Love it. Love it. Love <laughs> it. And I'm love contemplating it. if she and I can, uh, coordinate or however you practice i would love to do glenda the good witch and her golden retriever and paddle it. across the lake i will have to stand up or else it would look well i guess i could kneel but the whole point is to paddle across the lake standing up and so that's you know it's like is that going to change the world no but it's like you know what we moved here for a different quality of life and sometimes it's like the shopping up here sucks. You know, I got to drive like 40 minutes to get to a decent target. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. but it's like shopping is not my all, my be all. So that's fine. You know, whatever. Right. I have so much right. fun with the dog and the, we go sometimes out on the golf cart race, you know, go around the golf cart at sunset with the dogs and, you know, just, there are so many simple pleasures. There were simple pleasures with my mom just watching kids. Sometimes I'd put my head back on the bench, let the sun, you know, just rejuvenate me. Sometimes I'd deal with emails on my phone. She had joy. I got to relax. I mean, it's just, I think we need to just focus on, you know, quality of life, joy in life, and not worry about like maintaining, like I gotta, like, I gotta put my mom on a vegan diet because that's better for your brain. And it's like, I'm sorry, their brain is diseased. You can do whatever you want, but right. I know, right. I, 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 I know people that do all that stuff and it's like their loved one. I mean, obviously they're still going to die, but they've had a really good quality. So everybody's got to, you know, I have a designer person that I follow. It's like, he's always saying you do you. And that's, yeah. that's important. But I was going to ask you, we were talking about improv and uh, therapeutic fibbing. Do you want to explain how you helped your mom at the very end of life when she was um, frustrated with the lack of planning when she was, yeah. she was going away. She knew she was going away. <laughs> you knew she was going on a journey and she didn't know where. And one day she got it in her head that she needed to go back home to Ireland. And she asked me for the bus schedule to Ireland. And at this point, I was over the edge. I was exhausted. I knew the end was not far away. I was not sleeping well. You know, my high, my high school boys were begging me about driver's ed, and they both are special <laughs> needs, and I had to decide, do we want to even try? It was terrible. And I didn't have, so I, I just kept trying to change the subject. And one time I even tried to reason with her, and I said, but mom, you know, the bus is from Michigan to Ireland are not very reliable. And uh, besides, how would you climb up the steps with your walker? And she corrected me, oh no, 
Oh, no, they've gotten much better. And the conductor would help me. She was relentless. (laughs) And I was just exhausted. And she often thought there were two Britas and she would complain to me about the bad Brita, which I loved because then I got all the dirt on what she really (laughs) And one day, though, I noticed she was really upset in her chair and she was near tears. And I said, Mom, Mom, what's wrong? And she said, it's that Brida. She's horrible. I keep asking her for the bus schedule and she just won't get it for me. And something in my brain clicked. And I said, Mom, don't you worry about that bitch. I'm here today. I'll figure it out. I had no idea what to do. I I couldn't actually take her to Ireland. She couldn't even leave the house at this stage. But I remembered how much she loved to travel. And she would be so excited when she had booked a trip. She'd get her suitcase out weeks ahead of time. And I thought, what if I could make her a fake ticket? You know, a fake airline ticket or something. So I went to my computer and I Googled fake airline ticket. (laughs) And on the screen appeared the template of a boarding pass. So I started to fill it in. And departing airport, DTW, no problem. Arriving airport. Now, this was tricky because, you know, I could type in DUB for Dublin, but I thought, why not go one better? And I typed heaven. It took it. (laughs) Then it said travel dates, open. I noticed that it was first class and and it was an American Airlines boarding pass. Now, this was a random thing just popped up. My brother works for American Airlines. My mom tells everyone she's so proud. This was perfect. I got some cardstock, hit print. And within minutes, I had a boarding pass in my hands. And I walked over to mom's chair and I said, mom, don't worry. Don't worry. You're all set. You're good to go. And I handed it to her. And she got this look of clarity in her face and her eyes sparkled. And she she got a big grin and she said, oh, This is great. I'm going to show this one to Father Will. (laughs) She kept it near to her until the day she died. And she showed it to people when they came to visit. And they all had a good laugh. And they told her she was indeed blessed. And that moment of just, it was a miracle. It was a gift because I certainly didn't plan it. But I went to where she was. And I thought about what would make her happy. And I thought about how she loved to travel and how excited she would have when she would book her tickets and that she had this in her hand. And I, you know, I never, I've never had as good of an idea since then, I have to say. (laughs) So it was a miracle, um, but one that I'm really grateful for. And I absolutely love, 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 love telling that story because it, it lifts my heart and it's about thinking about what would be meaningful to the person that you're caring for. And it didn't cost any money and it wasn't hard, but it was about stepping into their brain, where they might be, what might be helpful, and then just finding a way to do it as silly as that might be. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful. Well, and it was simple. It was the, the act of it was so loving and the execution was super easy. I think we overcomplicate things sometimes. And that was such a simple, loving, easy thing to do that helped her, helped you. And, you know, if anybody would like to see what one of these tickets looks like, it took a little wrangling to get mine. <laughs> at the play (laughs) they kept forgetting to give it to me which i think is a hint (laughs) (laughs) um you know i maybe my maybe my destination isn't where what's written on the ticket but that will be in the show notes and on my social media so you could go there and go to the website and see it because they did pass them out at the play like i said i had to i had to wrangle mine Well, what's what's I love doing this. I decided this would be a great gift for everyone at the end of each performance. And then on the other side is my mom's recipe for her brown bread. And, oh, that's right. I forgot yep. about the brown bread. <laughs> brown bread. And um, then there's my contact information as well. So, And on my website, which is pretty simple, it's BritaMiller.com. There's lots of videos. There's lots of stories. And in fact, that story 
that I just shared with you is called Ticket to Heaven. And uh, when I was uh, on the Moth Radio Hour um, many years ago, that was really what launched me. And they loved it so much, they they put it on NPR nationally on, on the radio show. So if you go, you it, it's on my website in a number of different places, lots of stories and ideas and ways um, that I hope can help people. Well, that's, I, I like the uh, boarding pass. That's a great place to end. Brita's website, as always, is linked in the show notes. So you can go there. You do consulting, right? I You've do. Written- um, I do a lot of speaking to organizations if they want to have a storyteller. And I have two books. Yep. Yep. Um, I got them in my hand here. We got Take a Break Before You Break. This is the self care book for professional caregivers. Yeah. For, and then for we've professional. Got- yep. And the Caregiver Coffee Break. Take a break before you break 76 practical tips to help caregivers. They're really super easy to read. I mean, they're tiny. So for those of you who are looking at this on the YouTube channel, then you can see what they look like and you could go to her website and get them. They're awesome. And I want to thank you. And I would like everybody in the Fading Memories audience to put positive prayers and thoughts and all that good stuff out there because Brita is working on bringing this play to everyone. And she's in the process as of this recording, which is August 16th, 2022. And we can't talk about the details, but positive vibes coming her way. Okay, everybody? Exactly. And if you'd like to see a clip of the play, that's about a five minute clip, you can go to bridamiller.com. There's a page that's just dedicated to the show and you can watch some videos and get a sense of what it's about. and. When, I won't say if, but when it comes to your town, I hope that you will come out and see it. I would love to meet you. Awesome. Well, I enjoyed meeting Brita in Chicago. I hope that you can at least make it to San Francisco. Sacramento is a little closer to me, but I'll make it to San Francisco if you get there. And I want to thank you for joining us today and looking forward to seeing it again. Thank you so much. And and Jennifer, you're just delightful. I love what you're doing with your podcast and you're helping an awful lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs>